and away we go. We are in the middle of chapter 35. In this chapter, the author Rebbe is explaining the emphasis of the core Pusik upon which all of Tanya is based. Namely, behold, it is very near to you and in your mouth, in your heart, and the emphasis that we are particularly focused on here is la soisei, so you will do it. And we last week introduced the um, analogy from the um, Yanuka. The Yanuka really just means the youngster. He was the son of Rav Hamnuna Saba, and it suggests there's a sort of youthful energy. And he gave us a marshal, which we will hopefully be able to do a screen share here, and you will have a greater appreciation for, which is the marshal of a flame. So you see here, thanks to Wikipedia, you have the flame, which represents um, the, the, the divine, the Kedusha. You have the wick, which represents the body. And how do we make sure that the flame does not overwhelm the body or the body does not smother the flame? And the answer is the oil. And the oil is the mitzvahs. When we do a mitzvah, we regulate the relationship between the flame and the wick, between the infinity of Hashem and the finiteness of the human being. As we have talked about under numerous contexts, the core theological issue that really is what distinguished the Balshemta's whole approach from everyone who preceded him was predicated on this essential question. How does an infinite God create finite creatures? Don't the finite creatures get overwhelmed by the infinity of Hashem? Or the infinity of Hashem has to get pushed away by the finite creatures. The finite and the infinite are going to crowd each other out, like a flame and the wick. Either the wick is going to be so thick it's going to smother the flame, or the flame is going to be so intense it's going to consume the wick. The answer of Tzimtzum is that Hashem is not pushed away and Hashem is not minimized. He only presents himself in a minimal fashion. What still, though, is it that allows there to be a, an awareness, what we would, might describe as a relationship between the finite creation and the infinite Hashem, between the wick and the flame? And the answer there is, and this is, again, something that we're familiar with, I use the term in the culture of Chabad, and this is where it is in the academic, is mitzvah actions. And this is the core essence of, excuse me, are you Jewish? Yes, will you please do mitzvah? Because it is specifically through mitzvah actions, which in our mushal here from the Yanuka, is the oil that calibrates the relationship between the divine, the flame, and the human, the wick. Without the oil, the, 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 the wick becomes consumed in the flame or the flame becomes smothered by the wick. So our issue that we're going to be sort of addressing now, our question is, why is it that the mitzvahs have to be the oil that sustains it? Why can't the neshama itself be that way? Why not? Now, why can't the guf itself, why can't our humanity just sustain Hashem in its standard sort of indigenous human form? And the explanation is because our humanity is too self-concerned and therefore, innately, it pulls away from God, even if it accepts God. It only is accepting God in as much as God will satisfy its objective. So if he says, yes, I accept God because it makes me feel more prosperous or it will lead me to uh, all other types of benefits, which, of course, is true, but then I'm not really welcoming God. Then I'm trying to go through God to get to the different benefits that that uh, I seek. But that's not about bringing God into this physical world. That's about getting something for me from this physical world. Why the, the question on the table, though, which we're going to address here is why can't it be the neshama? Why can't the neshama innately, independently, be the mechanism for bringing the infinity of Hashem into this world? And that becomes the issue uh, at hand here. So we are... In chapter 35, uh, if you have the original print, it's page Memdalid. If it's easier to find it, it's the Chitas, either for the 17th of a other in a standard year or the 6th of other two in a leap year or a different page in every other book. So here we go. 
Vihine. Beer marshal ze, shehim shal or hashkin ul or haner. This analogy that we just went through and we just revisited, where we talk about the um, the the uh, light of Hashem being compared to or understood by or analogized to the light of the candle. She'enu meir v'nechaz b'psila b'li shemen that the oil, I'm sorry, that the 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 flame and the wick will not uh, maintain a sustainable relationship without the oil, because without oil, the flame simply consumes the wick or the wick smothers the flame, as we talked about. Uh, the kach, and then on the, the lesson being what we call the nimshal, the mushal is the method we use to understand it. The nimshal is what we understand from the mushal. Um, uh, similarly, the Shechina, the divine presence, will not shayra rest al gufa adam on the body of a person, which is comparable to the wick. Only through maisim toivim. Now, maisim toivim we translate simply as good deeds, which of course raises the initial question why does the Alter Rebbe say? that it requires good deeds. We have a word for good deeds, that's mitzvahs. What is the difference between the standard term mitzvahs that we might have anticipated and the word and the term good deeds? So we explain that the emphasis here is that our mitzvahs have to be good deeds. Now, this is a the real sort of delicate point. We might argue, and there is a certain level certainly where this comes into play, that all mitzvahs are good deeds because they effectuate the purpose for which Hashem created the world. However, here we are not simply talking about the execution of our obligation. Since we are talking about sustaining and, and uh, um, almost creating the ongoing relationship between the, um, the, the divine presence, the Shrina, and our limited humanity, so it requires something more than simply checking off all the boxes of my activities. And that's what's alluded to by this phrase, quote, the good deeds. Good deeds mean the deeds which are uh, centered around the goodness. In other words, a mitzvah may be done out of a sense of obligation. A mitzvah can be done out of a sense of social compulsion. Everyone expects you to do it. A mitzvah can be done because I'm hoping to get some benefit. Those are mitzvahs to be sure, but they are not necessarily good deeds. That is, although they bring good to the world benefit, they are not driven by a goodness. And our definition of goodness is a selflessness that is driven towards effectuating and sustaining and perpetuating the relationship between Hashem and the person. So when the Alter Rebbe uses the phrase here, good deeds, of course, he's talking about good deeds that are mitzvahs. I mean, can we think of a good deed that's not a mitzvah? Probably not. I mean, helping everybody is the mitzvah of Avis Yisrael and et cetera, et cetera. There is no good deed that's not a mitzvah, but there can be a mitzvah that's not a good deed if we are not aware and attentive that the objective is, again, to effectuate the connection between the infinite and the finite, the flame and the wick. So our question is, uh, though, back on the on the table, why is it even for a tzaddik that he still has to do mitzvahs? Why can't the tzaddik simply be fully aligned with Hashem by the very essence of his neshama? Now, we just had this, it's a reference again in this week's parsha. The two eldest sons of Aaron, Nadav and Avihu, who brought a foreign fire before Hashem and died. So one of the explanations as to what did they do is that they tried to simply be neshamas without bodies. And they, 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 they didn't want to, well, I use this term, it's a little bit silly, you know, be bothered, quote unquote, with uh, the human experience. <laughs> they literally only wanted to be neshamas. Now, the question we might say is, well, why not? What, why is it that the tzaddik, even the complete tzaddik, who has totally transformed his animal soul into or exposed it for its innate godliness, et cetera, et cetera, why does he also have to do mitzvahs? 
why are his mitzvahs not uh, a distraction from the purity of the essence of his nesham? So this is the question on the table. Why is it specifically mitzvah actions? Now, again, we know this from, like I referred to it earlier, you know, the culture of Chabad, excuse me, a Jewish do a mitzvah. Now, again, out there in the Torah world, there are people who would say, if you have five minutes, better to learn Torah than to do a mitzvah. And it's not like, well, right, wrong. This, uh, I call it strategy, is what the Alter Rebbe is enunciating here specifically, explicitly, in the, the description of the most profound method through which we bring godliness into this world and we fortify that connection. And not just because you're not going to learn very much in five minutes. <clears throat> and not even because I'm not such a scholar, et cetera, et cetera. This is that point that it is through mitzvah action specifically. Again, even if we might think I'm not such a tzaddik and my mitzvahs are not done with the, the most profound form of kavana, et cetera, et cetera, and I have my imperfections, still our emphasis is that it is specifically mitzvah actions that uh, uh, link the spiritual, the, the shekhinah, the divine presence with the physical, with our humanity. And, if, and and here we're going to be discussing why is it that way? This is our statement. Now we're going to try and support it. So here we go. It's not enough with his neshama. So that classic statement that says, well, of course I am Jewish. That is my identity, which is true. That is not effectuating the relationship any more than saying, well, of course, I'm your child, but if, if I, I'm your child and you're the parent, don't, the, doesn't there need to be something that perpetuates and solidifies that kind of connection? Even though my neshama is a part of Hashem himself. So what could be a more profound method of um, bringing godliness into this world than to have a neshama? And yet we say that that's not sufficient. Now, again, there are certain degrees in which that is sufficient, and it does effectuate this type of healthy relationship. For example, there are times when the Jewish people are referred to as Adas Yisrael. Now, the word Adas, which we commonly translate as the congregation, comes from the word for aid. And aid, Ayin Dalit, is a witness. And to say that the Jewish people's presence attests, we bear witness to the infinity of Hashem. So our very existence is an attestation. And yet there is a more profound uh, 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 threshold or degree or impact of relationship that can only be achieved through mitzvah observance. Uh, so here it's understood. Why is that? Why can't the neshama be the oil? Why do we need to have mitzvahs? Here the Alter Rebbe says something that's like really profound. It sounds almost like a typo. He says that the neshama of a person, even if he is the complete tzaddik who has absolutely transformed his neshama and his animalistic impulses, and it is exclusively for God, and his only pleasure is in God, and he's totally one with Hashem. Oivet Hashem, and he serves God. That is that constant growth. You recognize this phrase from much earlier in Tanya, where it talks about the endless growth and the achievement and the transformation, like turning raw leather or animal skin into soft leather. The year of Ava, and he serves Hashem with reverence, and he serves Hashem with love. Bitanugim, and it's his only pleasure. So what could be greater than that, or what's the problem? Look what the author Rebbe says here. Afo Pikei, nevertheless, it's still not considered to be totally bottle. This person who all he loves is Hashem has no interest in himself to be able to be at a level that has total bittle, total surrender. No, he's not. Even this Tzadik Gomer who has no interest in anything other than Hashem, who is constantly uh, uh, stretching his relationship with Hashem, 
who serves Hashem with love and with fear at every level, still, his neshama has identity. And that level of identity is what keeps it somewhat apart from Hashem. There's still some sense of separation. And the uh, execution of mitzvahs is where there is no friction between the commander and the commandee. Because it is about, the bittel is about putting aside and doing in the service of Hashem. So even this tzaddik who has this highest level of total oneness with Hashem and so on, is still something of himself. He still has his identity. Every morning we say, the moida'ani, that he has returned my neshama. That means it has some of its own identity. The fact that it can be identified as my neshama, regardless of the fact that it is of the highest tzaddik, etc., etc. Which is not the case with mitzvahs. And again, the Alter Rebbe adds that adjective, the good deeds. We have to make sure that our mitzvahs are good deeds. Because the person can do a mitzvah begrudgingly or rather of rote and so on. This is the Ratzon of Hashem. Why do we do mitzvahs? Hopefully we do every mitzvah for the same reason. Because it is the will of Hashem. And that's what makes the mitzvah maizim toivim, a good deed. Otherwise, we're doing it because I think it's going to get uh, it's going to add something to my life, which is not a bad thing innately, and it's not untrue. But if that is the motivation, then am I really doing it for Hashem? So why should it effectuate closeness with Hashem when I'm doing it because it's going to somehow enrich my own life? And of course, the question becomes, what will happen if it won't enrich my life? What will happen if I did something with a certain intent and then that, that didn't manifest? Do I regret it? Do I say, you know, I wish I didn't do it? And this is what changes it. There's a curious statement in the Gemara. The Gemara says that if a person declares that they are doing a specific mitzvah for the hope of receiving a specific consequence, they enunciate, they're clear, they're doing this mitzvah because they want to get a certain reward. Is this acceptable, tolerable? So the Gemara uses a term. It says this is a complete tzaddik. Now, it's not a complete tzaddik the way that Tanya understands it. Again, it's, it's more of a uh, borrowed term. So then the commentaries, of course, raise their hand and say, well, why? Why is this? So it will not surprise you that there are more than one opinion. One opinion says, because he doesn't really mean that he's only doing it because he wants to get this reward. What he means is, I'm doing the mitzvah because it's a mitzvah. You don't have to buy me a present. But if you buy me a birthday present, I want to watch. Meaning, I'm doing it because I'm supposed to do it, because it's what Hashem wants. But if I'm allowed to ask for something, this is what I'm asking for. That's one interpretation. That in his essence, every Jew does a mitzvah for the same reason. Why do I do it? Because it's the will of Hashem. That's true of every mitzvah. And that's why every mitzvah's bracha, the introductory bracha, to every mitzvah begins with the same text. Uh, he has sanctified us with his mitzvahs, and he commanded me to fill in the blank, count the omer, blow the shofar, fix the mezuzah, light the candles. The, the essence of every mitzvah is identical. This is what Hashem has asked me to do, <clears throat> and therefore I am doing it. If I'm doing it already, if I could get something, this is what I like. That's one interpretation. The other interpretation is, a little bit more subjective. What happens if he doesn't get what he hoped for? Does he regret doing the mitzvah? Does he look back and say, I did this mitzvah because I was hoping to get a certain reward, and now I didn't get the reward, so I regret it. I, I wish I wouldn't have done it. I mean, if a person goes to a store to buy something and they don't have it in the store, he regrets going to the store. I shouldn't have gone. I should have gone to a different store. So does he regret it? Is there a look back where he says, I wish I hadn't done it because I didn't get what I was hoping for? So here as well, the, the, the issue or the character better of doing mitzvahs and what makes it so distinctive is that it is done exclusively for the purpose of Hashem. And that's why it brings the infinity of Hashem into this world even more than I want it. Now, remember we spoke about in the introduction the distinctive uh, uh, message of Hasidus in contrast even to Kabbalah, meaning certainly beyond the halachic, the purely human. 
even in Kabbalah, where it says that the goal of mitzvahs is to bring levels of godliness, which are intuitively, or not intuitively is the wrong word, which are indigenously outside of this physical world, and we want to bring them into this world. The Kabbalistic terminology for that is this godliness that's in this world is called memale kolam, and he fills all the worlds. I call it the square pegs and the square holes and the round pegs and the round holes. God attenuates the godliness that's given to me versus the table versus the chair. Each one is different. And then there's, of course, a level where to God, what's the difference between me and the table and the chair? And, the, and Kabbalah says that when we do mitzvahs, we are able to bring even this sort of non-earthbound level of godliness into the world. Comes Chassidus and says that the goal or the the not not, the, not just the goal, but the impact of mitzvahs is that we bring what is called in Kabbalistic terminology atzmus insight, the essence of Hashem, the essence of Hashem Himself. So whereas we have the mitzvahs, we talked about this just to review for a moment, where I can perfectly understand, I don't steal and honor parents and so on. Those are humanly appreciable mitzvahs. Then we have mitzvahs that I can't understand. Why is meat good and milk good, but meat and milk is not good? So, but I understand what meat is, and I understand what milk is, and I understand that I can't put meat and milk together, even though I know what those things are, but I don't know why. But then there's a level that is even higher, and that level should be manifest even in, um, even in uh, the, the reasonable mitzvahs. Even within the reasonable mitzvahs, we should have the atzmas, the essential level of God, impacting it so that we don't honor parents or not steal because of their logic and because of how they benefit me humanly. I do it for the infinity of Hashem. There is a, a story that Remendel Futafas used to tell. So Remendel Futafas was a great chassid. He passed away about 25 years ago who uh, had literal surrender of his own life for other Jews, helping smuggle Jews out of Russia in the 50s and the 60s and 70s. And he was finally caught. And he, he had helped so many other people. And he was sentenced to and spent 16 years in a Soviet labor camp. And he survived. And he came out. And he lived in Eretz Yisrael. And he was a great celebrated chassid. So there are two stories that he tells which somewhat illustrate a little bit about this idea. So when he was there in Russia in this Soviet labor camp, of course, there was nigh on impossible to do many of the mitzvahs. And even though there were people who would try to send him care packages, but it was very difficult to get anything through. And of course, things got stolen and to delivery up to the Siberian wastelands and so on and so forth. So there was many a Pesach where he could never get even a matzah and so on. So he tells a story about how one year on Pesach, he got nothing. He had no matzah. So he sat down to his makeshift Seder and he had uh, a raw egg. And he imagined that this was the four cups of wine. And he had some potato peels or whatever it was. And he imagined that this was the matzah. And he uh, was able to conduct his Seder. One year, he was able, they were able to get through some package that had some matzahs in it and it had a few things in it and he was able to have them. Now in this prison he had, there were all, all kinds of prisoners and some who probably deserved to be in prison not because they were helping Jews to escape Russia or teaching Torah but they were just thugs and criminals and amongst this uh, sort of uh, assorted crowd there were two Jewish men who were in fact probably guilty of some pretty uh, 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 bad crimes. And Remendel sort of uh, befriended them and try, tried to bring them to some Kedusha, but they were not interested. So when he got this, uh, this these matzahs, he was so happy. So he told these two other Jewish guys that they were going to eat the matzahs with him. You know, he was going to make a seder. And they were not interested. And they said no. However, in this sort of rough and tumble uh, survival of the fittest prison camp, Remendel had uh, earned a, a degree of respect from the other uh, 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 inmates. So these other inmates, many of whom were, in fact, not just political prisoners, but were thugs, when they heard that Remendel wanted these other two guys to eat matzah, they told him, you're going to eat the matzah with Remendel, because he said you have to, and you're going to do it. And they said, we don't want to. They said, if you don't, we're going to kill you. 
So they sat down to that Seder and they ate the matzah with Rav So these are the two stories. So the question then becomes, which one is greater? Is it greater the time that Remendel sat with no matzahs and no wine and he just had to pretend and imagine that his raw egg was wine? Or was it better for these two criminals who didn't want to be there, who were only there eating the matzah because they were afraid that if they didn't do it, they'd be pummeled by the, the rest of the criminals and therefore they ate the matzah, not because they thought about the exodus, not because they thought about Hashem, not, the, not for any other reason other than they knew it would save their lives. Now, again, this is in the most extreme, but at some more, at least metaphoric lesson, this is what we tell kids, you know, if you do well in your schoolwork, if you learn your chumash, I'll buy you a bike, and so on. So there is a, a certain degree. So at what point, which one is greater? So we could go round and round, but ultimately we would say, based on what we're saying here in this chapter, is that when they eat the matzah, even though they're eating matzah because they don't want to get beaten up by these thugs, that's why they're eating matzah. Not because they understand Yitzhiya Mitzrayim, not because they are um, committed to uh, the personal exodus and so on. But the fact is, they're Jews eating matzah, ipso facto, they have effectuated the infinity of Hashem into this least evidently of godly places in this Siberian labor camp. Now, out there in the world, many people will say, well, who cares that they ate matzah? The other story where Remendel was so concerned and, and that he was willing to put, the, that's great. But the fact is he didn't eat matzah that year. That's the fact. The fact is that year, the other year, when he did get his care package, he did not eat matzah. So again, this is the emphatic point that we're saying here, that when we execute the will of Hashem, and of course it was a mistake, you know, we're not talking about right, wrong. We're talking about the impact that it makes. So here the Altar Rebbe says, Hashem's Ratzon is the whole reason for creation. The whole reason why Hashem created the world is because of something that He wants. And again, this is another crucial point Hopefully it sounds like obvious to us. It's another crucial point that Hasidus emphasizes that the whole reason why the world exists is because it's what Hashem wants. The dear Batachtain in the dwelling place in the lowest of worlds, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, all that contributes to the effectuation of Hashem's will is meaningful and significant if it doesn't then it's missing the point you know to be focused on what we're doing to be absolutely fixated in our objective you know to make sure that we get from where we are to where we want to be it's driven by Hashem's Ratzai now it's important because sometimes in the English they translate it as desire or as will but we're blessed that when we think about desire, we have the um, luxury to uh, associate that with almost frivolous things, you know, because we're not worried, I hope, that we're not going to have lunch today, that we're not that we're going to starve. But when we talk about the rutzoin, we're talking about that which is the essence that drives us. Now, out there in the world, we might ask somebody, what is the essence that drives you? And they don't know. It's success, uh, uh, whatever it may be. Because again, we have the luxury to daydream about relatively small things. But what we mean here is to be absolutely honed in like a laser beam on what the purpose is for what we are doing. And that's the, the will of Hashem. The will of Hashem is to be absolutely focused in on the purpose for what we are doing. And that's what drives all of creation. So every step along the way becomes validated as it contributes to the um, the execution of the ultimate purpose, the Ratzon of Hashem. If something doesn't contribute to the Ratzon of Hashem, then it is a distraction. And when we effectuate that Ratzon, you know, if you think about a manufacturer who comes up with a great idea, and then he has to come up with a prototype, and he has to develop it, and he has to engineer it, and it has to be cost-effective. But ultimately, if people don't buy his mousetrap, the whole purpose of his uh, company ceases to be. The whole company goes out of business if even though the person who's shopping doesn't know and they buy a worse mousetrap, they buy something less 
uh, effective. And they overspend for all these other things. The fact of the matter is the whole goal is to sell the product. And, and every, every step is, should be designed to be efficient to make sure the product gets sold. And this happens in all forms of, uh, 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 of missions where we get distracted. The person really wants to see their name in the New York Times. So they take out an ad in the New York Times. I, the people who read the New York Times are not buying their product, but they get distracted. Or they really want to sell it at a certain price point because it, it, it somehow pads their ego that their product is sold at this price point and so on. They get distracted from their objective, <laughs> just as a, a very mercenary illustration. Uh, there was a person being interviewed and they said, but you're in the steel business. Why are you? This guy says, I'm not in the steel business. You're not? No, I'm in the making money business. That's, that's what I mean. I do this to make money. I'm not doing this because I believe in the prov provision of steel to the world. I'm in the making money business. Now, again, you know, we hopefully that's not our objective, but we are in the God business. That's the objective. And, and to make sure that that gets effectuated. Otherwise, we get distracted. Meaning, if we're in the what makes me feel good business, so then... Again, you know, out there in the world, I make this Seder at six o'clock because it's too late at 8.30. I, at six o'clock, it's not Pesach yet. But I feel like it's Pesach. I'm not even disagreeing with that. And it gives me, but I'm not effectuating the plan. I, then I'm doing it when it, the objective is because of what it does for me. But if I'm in the service of Hashem, so Hashem wants me to eat matzah at 8.30, not at 6.30. And if I eat matzah at 6.30, I'm doing what I want. And if I eat matzah at 8.30, I'm doing what Hashem wants. So the whole purpose of, that drives all of creation, that is the initial creation and the ongoing sustaining of creation, is Hashem's will. And this is what we hope to uh, complete when we do a mitzvah. <speaking in Hebrew> The whole purpose that's driving all of these stages, all of these tzimtzumim, all of this, we use the word effort that Hashem goes through to conceal himself and to minimize his expression so he doesn't overwhelm us, etc., etc. is obviously boros yesh until he can create something out of nothing. And something that stands on its own. canal and will not become totally buckled. So again, we think about the work, so to speak, that Hashem puts in to create a world where there is opportunity for denial of Hashem. In order that we overcome that denial and we uh, act upon Hashem's instruction and we do the mitzvah. So all of this work is driven by the hope that Hashem will, in, that, that we will in fact do the mitzvah. And if we do the mitzvah, we are in a sense validating the whole purpose of creation. If we don't do the mitzvah, then we have missed the whole purpose, the, the whole, this whole exercise, like going on a business trip and not getting the sale. If I don't get the sale done, then it was a waste of time. The objective was not just to go through some exercise. The objective was to execute the plan. And if the plan is not executed, then everything that was put into it is unvalidated or non-validated. Um, so where can we discover this infinity of Hashem? Where can we discover that which drives all of the purpose of creation? Not within the creation itself, because the creation itself in its innate state conceals godliness. Where can we find the infinity of Hashem? That's in the execution of the mitzvah. Because when we do the mitzvah, and again, we do it as Maisim Toivim, we do it with this awareness, that is, in fact, the essence and the infinity of Hashem. It's much like we talk about the objective of the coming of Mashiach is not for us to be triumphant and say, we won, you lost, we're right, you're bad, ha, ha, ha. The objective is that it allows us to execute the mitzvahs, which we have not been able to do, including, as the Rambam points out, 
a mitzvah that we've never been able to do. It has to do with the establishment of the cities of refuge. That, has ne- that is a mitzvah that Hashem wants, and He has never had it. Not only has Hashem not had all of the service of the Beis Amigdash for 2,000 years, and all the things associated with the Yidden living in Eretz Yisrael, and the laws of Yovel and Shemitah, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but this particular nuance about the establishment of additional cities of refuge, Hashem has never had it. So we might say, what do I need Moshiach? My life is pretty good. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. We, should, we don't want to look for Moshiach out of our personal desperation. We want to look for Moshiach out of Hashem's eagerness for the fulfillment of this purpose. And again, that was the whole plan all along. So the mitzvah has become the opportunity for us to ha- experience, I'll use this term, sort of raw godliness. This is essentially our um, relationship, so to speak, with nature. You know, in the world, we say there is natural, and the alternative is like phony and the plastic and sort of, but we offer the world, Torah, I should say, offers the world something other than nature, and that's the supernatural. So Hashem gives us the natural, and our job is to turn the material into the spiritual. So whereas, you know, there's this great reverence for nature, because we think that the old, I mean, the secular world thinks, or to them, what's offered to them is you have nature, or you have sort of less than nature, plastic and phony and saccharine kind of thing. Kedusha says the alternative to nature is to evoke the supernatural. How do we do that? Through mitzvahs. So Hashem gives us the natural, the world, like Hashem put us in Gan Eden, and yet Hashem gave Adam and Chava a chore in Gan Eden. You think Gan Eden is perfect. In Gan Eden, you just don't touch anything. Just um, uh, uh, admire the Gashmias. Just admire the state of being, better way of saying it. And yet, that's not what Hashem said. He said, I want you to work it and to guard it. So guard it, right, don't break anything. And work it, why do you have to work it? It's Gan Eden. Because it is there for a purpose, and that purpose is the execution of the mitzvahs, which is what drives all of creation. But creation innately in its pristine state is not the execution of the mitzvahs. It's the opportunity to do the mitzvahs. <speaking in Hebrew> What does it mean that the divine presence should be here? It means that we should reveal godliness. And that's that old saying, you know, where is God? Wherever you let him in. How do you let him in? By stepping aside. As long as it's, uh, I I put myself there, so it crowds out others. And the infinity of Hashem in whatever matter, matter with a T, matter, um, uh, it expresses itself. Behind all this means, this item, becomes completely subsumed within the infinity of Hashem. We have a curious uh, historical illustration in the description of the building of the Mishkan, which is sort of the most profound first step where we take these people who had been slaves and who had violated Hashem's uh, relationship with the golden calf, and now they are in uh, this this uh, extreme effort to reintroduce the infinity of Hashem into their presence. So they are told to do something of the most material form. They're not told to fast, and they're not told to separate themselves from material things. On the contrary, they're told to become fully engaged in the craft of the material, to take material things and transform them into spiritual things wood and gold and animal skins and so on and so forth. In the Beis Amigdash, they even can use stone, the, the, the creation that doesn't even uh, show any sign of life, it does, unlike even a plant which grows, at least it shows some sign of life. But in the Mishkan, they didn't have that. And again, this is described as the ultimate illustration. Here you take physical things, which could be used for godliness, could be used for selfishness. And when I use them for godliness, I expose that innate godliness. And then we find a little curiosity that one of the ingredients that is, or one of the materials that is on the list is called the tachash, tough ches shin. And it's a skin from an animal that is used in the tapestry in the mishkan. 
So this is an unusual word. We don't find it otherwise. And again, uh, it will not surprise you that there are multiple interpretations. One interpretation is it's a type of ram that they dyed its skin and they used it to, uh, to, to in, the, in the Mishkan. But there's another interpretation that the Tachash is an actual animal called the Tachash. And there was only one of them created. It did not have a mate and therefore it never reproduced. Why would Hashem create this one-time animal that had colored skin, like the, uh, the, the, the juicy fruit zebra that had multiple colored skin? So we explain because it was created and it only had one use. And that use was in the Mishkan. That was its only purpose. Otherwise, it had no reason for existence. And that's why there was no mate. So we would never reproduce and there wouldn't be herds of Tachash. Okay, so this sort of jumps out, you know, why would Hashem do this? Hashem doesn't make miracles unnecessarily. And so one of the answers we give is that most of life is all about the, 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 the tension between the material and the physical and the spiritual. So I have a piece of wood. I could use it for my own house or I could use it for the service of Hashem. I have a wool. I could use it to make my own coat or I could use it to make the tapestries for Hashem. And this is part of the, I'll use the term exercise that the Jewish people went through in the wilderness where Hashem said, look, you used gold to make a golden calf. Now you need to do the opposite. Now you need to use gold or all material things to illustrate that they are in the service of Hashem. So most of life is about every time I encounter something, am I using it for Hashem or using it for myself? Am I eating because I'm just hungry or am I eating so that I'll have energy to serve Hashem? Am I sleeping because I'm lazy or am I sleeping so I'll have energy to serve Hashem? Oh, back and forth, back and forth. Do we ever get a break? Do we ever get just get to sort of not have this tension? And the answer is yes. And that's what's represented by the Tachash because it has no other purpose other than to serve Hashem. It's like Yom Kippur. It's like we say to Hashem, you know, I can't do that. You know, every day, make the world a godly place. It's hard. Hashem says, you're right, it's hard. I'm going to give you a vacation day. This is one day you don't have to worry about the world. You don't have to be social. You can be totally self-indulgent. You could just be completely in your own world. You don't have to worry about anything or anybody else. And you can just be purely uh, selfish. Because look, we need it. We're not uh, machines. We, we need that, that uh, boost. So imagine if we could do the same with all material things. I mean, we are blessed. You know, if you ask a kid in Cheder, what is the purpose of money? He says, well, to put it in tzedakah. That's the purpose of money. Why do you have water? To wash your hands. You know that people use money for other things? Really? Right? Stunned. You know, it's like the closest analogy that I can think of is an esrig. You know, there are people who just think an esrig is food. I mean, in, in, to me, this, I wouldn't even know that there was such a fruit called an esrig if not for the mitzvah. But I guess in places where esrigim grow during season, they just use it. That surprises me. People use an esrig and they don't even know it's a mitzvah item. That's an example. Hopefully we can find other examples in our life. This is what we are trying to achieve with every physical thing. Imagine if we could see every material item exclusively in its purpose in the service of Hashem. Um, if it will be totally bottle, like we said, if we will totally step aside, then we will have this infinity of Hashem. If we will allow it, you know, where is God? Wherever you let him in. How do you let him in? By stepping aside, by not being in the way. Aval bat call mashaloi bata love and matthias ligamre anything that is not completely and exclusively surrendered to the infinity of Hashem. And we gave the most ironic example earlier, which is the neshama. Meaning, of course, you know, a person who is bloated ego, uh, a caricature, that we understand. The question is, if my neshama, which has its own identity, I don't want that. I am. I love Hashem. But it's still about I it's still about I love, I fear, is still predicated on self. This is what Hashem does for me. This is how Hashem makes my life better. It's still tethered to my identity and my character. Then 
there's going to be a friction between the infinity of Hashem and my existence. Even the complete tzaddik, who is attached to Hashem with absolute love, right? Uh, his thoughts cannot grasp Hashem. He cannot be as close with Hashem. There is a story that the Reb Marash was once the fourth Rebbe of Shmuel, whose birthday was last week, Bezir, four days ago, was once teaching his son, who would grow up to be the Rebbe after him, about you know some complex concept in, uh, in Hasidus. And then he sort of caught himself and he said, and yet all of that pales in comparison to help a Jew earn even a few pennies. So, wow. Why? Because that's how much as I understand. How much do I understand? To the fullest uh, um, uh, extent of my capacities. But it's, the, it's therefore limited to the fullest extent of my capacities. But when I serve Hashem by doing a mitzvah, and now I am again validating the whole purpose for all of creation. This is why creation exists. This is why Hashem created the world. In order to reach this level, when I do that, now I have truly fulfilled the purpose of creation. Otherwise, I'm trying to understand it. And maybe an analogy would be, I can describe to you what an apple tastes like for hours and hours, but nothing will teach you what an apple tastes like, like tasting an apple. If you'll taste the apple, that will give you a fuller understanding or recognition better of what an apple tastes like than all the explanations I could ever possibly give you. The actual experience. So even the tzaddik Gomer is not able to grasp Hashem. I mean, this is, you now you could start to see where this could, like we would say, ruffle some feathers. You know, not everybody was so thrilled about this message from the Alter Rebbe. Because there is a great passionate desire to sort of detach myself from the world. To see mitzvahs as something that's this is an extreme, uh, like uh, outside of my relationship. Here I am at this lofty level. And uh, as I've told the story before, the father was said to his son, don't love me so much, just pick me up on Tuesday. You know, don't tell me, I love you, I love you. I love you, that's nice, but pick me up on Tuesday. That's when I'm coming, pick me up on Tuesday. Again, we're not talking about good and bad here. We're talking about infinite and finite. Um because Hashem is innately infinite and therefore Hashem's infinity makes him ultimately ungraspable. So can you really know anything about Hashem? We might say ultimately not. We can only know about how Hashem operates. You know, we are very cautious in to, uh, about quote-unquote describing Hashem. In large part, this is why we are discouraging of making up our own um, uh, uh, um, compliments, I guess, for Hashem. And rather, we rely on Moshe Rabbeinu. Uh, we, in, we incorporate in the davening. Moshe said uh, that God is kale, rachum, he's merciful and so on. Well, Moshe said it, but really, I got to be careful. If I'm saying it, maybe I'm describing or ascribing something rather petty. Because what can I understand? Uh, it's, a, it's a child's perspective. I'm only understanding something at a, um, at, at a limited level. So the, the alternative to that is the infinity of Hashem that is experienced when I actually do a mitzvah. That uh, welcomes in the complete infinity of Hashem. Vim Cain, Zeha Oyev. So when somebody says, but I love Hashem, and again, it's not one or the other, but sometimes it can get in the way. I love Hashem, I love Hashem. Will you do a mitzvah? I love Hashem, I love Hashem. It's like, do you do kindness? Do I do I, I have a PhD in kindness. I wrote 12 books about kindness. Did you ever do any kindness? I'm writing another book about kindness. Again, it's important that we understand when it results in changed behavior. And this is such a core, I don't want to call it dividing point because Jews are never divided, but it's a, the philosophy of Chabad that is markedly different than other 
ways in which people attempt to serve Hashem. Because again, I'm still a yesh. It's still me. I love Hashem. It's still predicated on self. And therefore, there's going to be a degree of separation. Vain or Hashem, Shayru Muskalabai, Ella Al Yede, Kim Amitzvis. Hashem's full presence only rests when you do a mitzvah. So when Ramendal Futafas uh, drank the raw egg and he cried about not having wine or matzah, there was an intense closeness with Hashem, but not as intensely close as the two thugs who were eating matzah only because they were afraid they were going to get beaten up. Um, because that is the rotsoin, the passion of Hashem. And again, we say passion, we're not talking about passion like a person has a passion for art or something. We're talking about the most profound form of passion that we can experience is to be alive. <clears throat> this is what drives all of creation. It is effectuated by the execution of the mitzvahs. And again, it's not a judgment or a criticism, et cetera, et cetera. But the, those are the facts on the ground. There is a, a story, it's a bit of a long story, but there was a, a, a shliach of the Rebbe, he's passed away years ago, his name is Rabbi Beryl Baumgarten, and he was sent by the Rebbe to Argentina like in the 50s, and it was still like a backwards country. And there's a whole long story where <clears throat> he was on a ferry, in his, and he was sitting in his car being ferried across some river, and the ferry broke and his car went into the water and he almost drowned and he was miraculously able to force his way out and, and swim to safety. But his primary concern wasn't his car, but that his tefillin were in his car. And since he had boarded this ferry early in the morning, he hadn't davened. So when he was rescued, he started looking around. He's in the middle of the forest there. He found a phone and he found the closest Jewish community and he hired a plane I mean, it's like crazy story to fly to this place. And he said, when I land there, please bring me a pair of tefillin. And he hired this private plane and he flew to wherever it was. When he got there, the people were there. And he said, where's the tefillin? They said, Rebbe, tefillin, we brought you a whole Torah. And he, he did not put on tefillin that day. And he was very upset. So he went to, the next time he came to, to the Rebbe, he told the Rebbe the story. And he asked the Rebbe, what can I do to fix the fact that I didn't put on tefillin? Now, if you would ask me, you'd say, what are you talking about? Who could ever imagine that he, he almost died and he rented the plane and he flew and he did everything. <laughs> but the facts of the matter is he didn't put on filling. And rather than just, you know, dismiss it, he meant it with seriousness. He wasn't just, you know, this wasn't some sort of like, oh, I'm so upset. He meant it. The Rebbe did, in fact, I don't know what, gave him some method to correct this. Some what's called a tikkun. Now you'd say, oh, that's ridiculous. Who could be? But it illustrates this point that when we do a mitzvah, we effectuate godliness more, even the renting the plane and so on. Again, it's not about fault or blame and so on. It illustrates this core point that mitzvah activities bring, or, or uh, I don't want to say validate is the wrong word, but they complete the purpose for which Hashem created the world more than all the love and even all the wisdom and all the knowledge and all the understanding. Uh, because there is, I think Shane Rotson, Lishum Hester Punin. There is no Hester Punin. That's the crucial phrase. Concealment of the essence of Hashem, which there can be in Torah study and scholarship and love and meditation and analysis. All good. They're all important. We're not downplaying them. They, they are significant in their contribution to the infinity of Hashem. What is the method through the true infinity of Hashem? Is only through mitzvah observance. Now we go into the Haggah, the note. And just a general reminder, the notes are like parenthetical, which means you could skip the note and still understand the point. And since Tanya is not designed to be purely an academic text that is trying to explain uh, conceptual ideas, Rather, it is a very pragmatic direction towards how we can experience a closeness with Hashem. So there's something here that the Alter Rebbe anticipates that the students, us, would, um, would be enriched by, by understanding. So he says, As I heard from my teacher, his teacher, of course, being the Magid, that's the student of the Baal Shem Tev, 
Perish Vatam Mashkos Vaitzchaim. He explained this that it says in Eitzchaim. Eitzchaim is a book of the Kabbalah. Shorin Saif Baruchu in the Mesiachet Afilu Ba'in the Matzilis. That even in the world of Atzilis, and remember, the world of Atzilis means a state of total awareness of Hashem. It's not a it's not a locale. It's a state of total awareness of Hashem. It's the it's the awareness level that the tzaddik has that maybe we can touch from time to time when we're so clear about our relationship with Hashem. Even then, even then, we have to have some connector point. And that connector point is Chachma. Now, the word Chachma, if you look it up in the Hebrew English dictionary, usually translates as something like wisdom or intelligence or something like that. But as we have pointed out, it is not uh, data, it's not even capacity IQ. It's about a willingness to get beyond myself, a true openness to whole new ideas. Because what Chachma is, and what we're trying to incorporate even in our midst of fulfillment, is this total acceptance of that which comes from above. You know, in the Gemara, there is an interesting discussion uh, about what is greater, to do the mitzvahs we are commanded to do, or to do the mitzvahs that we're not even commanded to do. So we go back and forth. On the one hand, you say, well, if you're commanded to, that already makes you biased. You know, you have to, so you do it. When I'm not commanded to, when I do it voluntarily, that's a little bit more of a, um, an illustration of my commitment to Hashem. On the other hand, uh, things I'm not commanded to do are like, uh, like icing on the cake. It's like uh, uh, it, it adds to it, but it's not the, the essence. The essence is... What I'm commanded to do, that's why Hashem commanded me, because this is the primary purpose for which I am created. And ultimately, this is, in fact, the Gemara's conclusion, that it's greater to do the mitzvahs which I am commanded to do versus doing the mitzvahs that I am not commanded to do. Why? Because ultimately, the commandment indicates that this is where Hashem's focal point is. This is what drives all of creation. And again, this is one of the core messages of Hasidus, that it teaches us how the mitzvahs affect Hashem. Other parts of Torah, from the halacha, even to the Kabbalistic, will teach us how the mitzvahs affect us. If uh, we will follow the rules of Torah, we'll have civil societies, we'll, et cetera, et cetera. Or, as we talked about before with the Kabbalah, we'll bring down levels of godliness that are beyond the reach of this world. Chassidus turns it around and says, the mitzvah, the, 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 the purpose of creation is the fulfillment of Hashem's will, so, which is executed via the mitzvahs. Hashem tells us what he wants us to do. Back in the text, when a person is engaged in Torah, that is, when they are engaged in Torah study, then his godly soul, with the two more personal characteristics, his power of speech and his power of thought, they become consumed when he is studying a concept in Torah, he becomes consumed with his intellect and his spoken word to try to, to grasp and understand this concept in Torah. They are absolutely one with Hashem. At that moment, he is completely consumed with it. And in fact, godliness is dwelling on his neshama. Like we say in Pirkei Abbas, even though he's sitting by himself, nobody else is benefiting from this. And he is completely consumed intellectually and verbally with reaching to grasp Hashem. Ah, however, but again, there's something separated from him. There's an aspect of his existence which is detached. The Nafsha Bahamas and his, his animating character, which is that which gives him life and is invested within his humanity, for that, 
that has to be done exclusively or that is effectuated exclusively when his physical body is invested and that is when he is doing mitzvahs. Uh, that then his power of activity is in fact subsumed in the uh, the light of Hashem. All right, we'll stop here to continue next week. It's a long chapter, so it'll take us another week to get it done. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good Thank week. You, Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Wonderful. Really great. Good week. Thank you so, so much. Everybody, listen. All right, I'll send out the recording. Thank, Thank you. you.